it's the left that's the ruling elite now. So everything, when you read Marcuse, it's so ironic to me right now to read him because the way he describes dominance and the repression of uh, expression, it all applies the other way. Welcome everyone to Unsafe Space. I'm your host, Carter Laren. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can go to unsafespace.com slash donate to support the show, which enables us to have interesting conversations like the one that we're about to have. Um, today, I'm very excited to, to be joined by Dr. Michael Rechtenwald, who I think maybe has the, the honor of being one of the first canceled professors that I can think of. Um, he was a professor of liberal studies and global liberal studies at NYU from 2008 to 2019. He also taught at Duke University, North Carolina Central University, Carnegie Mellon University, and Case Western Reserve University. His scholarly and academic essays have appeared in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, Academic Questions, Endeavor, the British Journal of the History of Science, College Composition and Communication, International Philosophical Quarterly, uh, the DeGruyter uh, Anthologies, Organized Secularism in the United States and Global Secularisms in a Post-Secular Age, and the Cambridge University Press Anthology, George Eliot in Context, among others. He holds a PhD in Literary and Cultural Studies from Carnegie Mellon University, a Master's in English Literature from Case Western Reserve University, and a BA in English Literature from the University of Pittsburgh. Professor Rechtenwald is a pundit and champion of free speech and opposes all forms of of authoritarianism and totalitarianism, including socialism, communism, social justice, fascism, and political correctness. As the notorious the anti-PC prof on Twitter, he has appeared on numerous major network political talk shows, on syndicated radio shows, and on numerous YouTube shows and podcasts. He's also the author of multiple books, including Springtime for Snowflake, Snowflakes, Google Archipelago, and his latest Beyond Woke. You can follow him on Twitter at the anti-PC prof, or you can go to michaelrechtenwald.com. We'll put links to this stuff below. It was a long introduction, but uh, <laughs> thank you for joining, uh, Michael. Thanks for having me. So maybe we should start by having you just tell the audience briefly how you became known as the short pants white devil. <laughs> yes, I am the short, dance, uh, short pants white devil and Satan. So <laughs> I've heard. Well, here right? I am. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, t I started this Twitter account. It, the, it was called AntiPCNYU Prof at the outset. You know, just tweeting criticisms of the sort uh, that we see common to de commonly uh, uh, exhibited today. And so uh, before long, I was interviewed by a newspaper, by the student newspaper, and two days later, I was uh, put on paid leave, denounced by a committee called the Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Group, and the rest is history. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Um, and I was also consigned to the Russian department. They moved my office to the Russian department and put me in what I like to call my own personal gulag uh, because I had a office with nothing but bare metal shelves and no, uh, and totally isolated from the rest of the uh, university. Well, it's now there's incredible. evidence that you're a Russian troll. That's correct. So I am a bot, and I am, a, I am fixing the election for Trump. <laughs> yeah, I suspect it as much. One, one, of the, one of the things that I really like about you is, first of all, you're extremely prolific. You've written a lot, and there are a lot of smart people who write about this stuff. But um, I mean, this is not me blowing smoke, uh, but I, you're a delight to read because you're funny also. And oh, um, one of the things I wonder if you just start by relaying a story to us, which for me, you know, I don't I'm not an expert in postmodernism. I mean, you you were deep in it so we can get into that. Um, but one of the things for me that was probably one of the best, most succinct descriptions of postmodernism came from a conversation with your father. Uh, <laughs> you're very good with words, aren't you? Can you just tell us about that for a moment and why it applies to postmodernism? Yeah, well, you know, my fa I was a I used to be a kind of a provocateur with my family. I, I had a big mouth and uh, came from a very large family. Uh, I have eight siblings, and uh, I was just kind of known as the uh, instigator of you know talk back to my father. And uh, one time he just said, "Yeah, you're really good with words, aren't you?" 
And um, it was more or less to suggest that, you know, that that isn't everything. And uh, and um, so I, I think it applies to postmodernism because, you know, postmodernism reduces everything to language. Language becomes the means by which reality is constructed. It's called social and linguistic constructivism. And uh, so I think I think that phrase that that uh, that retort that my father uh, gave me really kind of typifies or really it, it kind of emblem emblematizes the whole postmodern project. I think. Now I don't. I think a lot of people would. It sounds hyperbolic to say what you're saying. I mean, I think you you wrote once about postmodernism. The postmodernist epistemological conviction that language constructs reality itself permits an eradication of materiality. Um, can you just talk about, I guess, if you had to give an overview for lay people of what postmodernism is? Uh, because it sounds yeah. just like crazy talk to most people, frankly. Yeah, well, it's a very, it's a very discontinuous, disparate set of theories. Uh, the, the, this was never a, a self-named school of thought. It was named post-talk by others, but the, the, the notion of postmodernism as a way of thinking, as a field, uh, was inaugurated in 1979 by uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard, and uh, he basically dis discussed this thing called the postmodern condition. And uh, this was supposedly typified by a break with modernity, in particular the idea that uh, there was progress in history, uh, that there were uh, there was a telos, there were master narratives that explained. Uh, you could have a master narrative that explained history and uh, basically uh, also science and other major endeavors. Uh, and so they disrupted all this and said that, you know, you don't have these master narratives. You can't know the whole. The totality is un, ungraspable. And uh, there are only these local local discourses, in effect, uh, and uh, that they're all charged with power. And uh, they also suggested that knowledge itself was derived from power and that uh, there was, it was a nexus of knowledge and power, as Foucault saw, Michel Foucault, where, whereas instead of, uh, as Bacon had said, uh, knowledge is power, what he was suggesting was that power actually creates knowledge, it produces it. And so whatever, is, whatever can be said, it has to be backed up by power to be considered knowledge. And so this makes everything a war of, all, a war of each against each and all. And uh, it, it makes the whole social order a matter of sort of power gambits uh, on the part of various groups. So this is why we see the kind of hostage taking and so forth that postmodern uh, acolytes and followers really fall in line with. Um, it, it really typifies, I think, so much of our culture right now. So I think we live in a postmodern age, but it was it was actually imposed on us. It, it didn't come through some natural development of history or the effects of the economy or something like that. Something that's striking me about this that's that's odd is it's um, at the same time this movement claims to be about uh, I'll just use for lack of a better term the little people or the commoner or like we're we're, we're sure. supporting the minorities. The underdog. Yeah, the yeah. underdog, and and yet. It's the kind of attitude that can really only exist through, uh, you have to have a, a cushy sort of elitism. Um, you know, you, mm -hmm. you wrote actually, and I'm going to actually, I just, I love this. I, I'm going to quote you to yourself because, you know, oh. that's a cool thing okay. to do. Um, <laughs> but uh, you wrote, postmodernist theorists and their followers have had a fondness for placing the real within ironic scare quotes, this pretension suggests that acknowledging an object world makes one naive. The snubbing of empirical information and the innocent flirtations with anti-objectivity have more often than not amounted to sheer nonsense. More importantly, such feigned bracketing of the real betrays the experience of those who wrestle with matter to stay alive, namely everyone. So it's this, at the same time, they're claiming to be these champions for regular people and yet, 
it's so detached from actual regular people's lives. It yes. can only be it's, a philosophy that elitists have. Yes, it's based on a whole series of anti-enlightenment or post-enlightenment or counter-enlightenment thought. And it, it arrives at these most ridiculous conclusions based on a train of reasoning, frankly, which they condemn in the first place. <laughs> so, I mean, there's no other way to get to it by virt than by virtue of reasoning. And then they, they reason themselves into this really uh, non-real corner, you know. And uh, the thing about this is whenever, and I said this in, in springtime for snowflakes, whenever you suggest that beliefs are unconstrained by the object world, by, re by something outside of the language, then... It, it allows for the imposition of these beliefs on others because there's no pushback from the object world. I mean, you can't say, well, that's not true because such and such, such and such evidence exists. They just say, well, that evidence is part of, you know, patriarchal, white, male, you know, uh, capitalist ideology, blah, blah, blah. So the real doesn't exist. Then they're able to impose their beliefs because there's no constraints. And so it's actually, well, some people suggest, oh, well, it's really libertarian. You, you can say what and think whatever you want willy-nilly. Yeah, that's the premise, that the real outcome is authoritarianism. Right. And, and there's, it's, libertarianism is, is I, I would think, I'm not an expert in libertarianism either, but I, I would think there's a presupposition that there's an objective reality that we're dealing with, and you should be allowed to do yeah. certain things, but, but not the postmodernist assumption that, Actually, your words just create reality, so have at it. That's right. It, it's a production. In fact, I, I've been rereading Jacques Derrida just to verify and validate my thinking about all this, and I'm also presenting a course on all this, too. Uh, and he says, basically, that the real is a production of language. There's no question about it. It's in black and white. And then he says, there is no outside, there's nothing outside of the text. Right. Uh, so uh, where, there's where nothing outside of language. Where, where can people... Uh, it'll be on uh, libertyclassroom.com for Tom Woods' uh, site. Oh, excellent. I love Tom Woods. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Yeah. I've yeah. been told that Derrida, you you can't... Well, I don't. this is probably just a deflection, but you can't understand yeah. Derrida unless you've read the French. Um, you have to read I the French. I don't know about that. I mean, this, this, there's all kinds of excuses made, right? He never said... They'll, they'll go on and say, there, he never wrote that there's nothing outside of the text. Oh, yes, he did. In black and white, he wrote it and several times. Um, so they'll say, well, that's what he means is that you can't speak of anything outside of the text because you have to use language to, 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 to refer to things. So therefore, there's nothing outside of the text. So he's really just talking about what can't be spoken. But he says nothing exists. It doesn't exist outside. There is nothing outside of the text. And, and in other places, he said, you know, nature, this and that, and these other things, they're not there. You know, there's no there there. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing to me that such, uh, honestly, I don't have a better word than crazy, but like such, such insanity can, can be taken seriously by so many people and then tried, like, we're going to try and implement that now. Um, right. I guess, so are you familiar with Thaddeus Russell? Yeah, somewhat. So I've, I, I'm, I'm only somewhat familiar with him as well, but my understanding is there's a kind of disagreement among people in describing social justice ideology that uh, I'm not sure where I stand on it because I've been, you know, as a layperson <laughs> just reading. There's the one camp that says this is postmodernism. And, and, and I think you've made mm -hmm. a very strong argument for why it's got postmodern roots. But there's a camp that says, actually, no, this is really critical theory. This is Marcusa. This is um, this is Gramsci. And it's not really postmodernism at all. And Thaddeus, I think, falls into this, this category of, of people who say, no, 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 postmodernism never tried to deal with the world, so you can't blame us. Can you address that well, a little bit? Yeah, there's truth to both. That's the thing. Okay, so the epistemological premises are postmodern. The tactical, uh, the tactical uh, means by which they, uh, they aim to achieve their ends uses cultural Marxism uh, or, you know, Gramsci and the critical theorists, Frankfurt School. So 
and also Maoism, which is cultural, you know, the cultural revolution ta tactics right. of struggle sessions and uh, and uh, auto criticism or self criticism, auto critique, I should say. So there's truth to both, but I'm talking about the postmodern political epistemological roots here in in, in springtime for snowflakes. Although I do talk about critical theory and how it it, it also impacted all this. Yeah, there there's. I don't know why that's a distinction without a difference, actually, I think. And, but and it, it's not true. It's not either or. It's both. That, I mean, that, that seems to make intuitive sense because um, you, do see, you do see them cherry-picking whichever arguments, whether they be critical theory arguments or postmodern arguments, to uh, advance that's their right. political agenda. Um, that's right. Because you see, like, the, the critical race theory is kind of explicitly anti anti-essentialist, like anti-postmodernism to the extent that you're not allowed to break down those categories. But uh, the that, moment well, we switch right. to gender, they're they'll They're essentialist when it's convenient. Whenever right. it's convenient, they're essentialist. And they're constructivist when, they're, when it's not. Right. Um, so, so can I ask you a question? Because one thing that struck me from reading Springtime for Snowflakes is, you know, you walk through, I mean, I don't know, if, I don't know if people understand, but you were like deep into post you were in postmodernism, like you, you got it, you were hook, line and sinker. I have a in PhD there. in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so one thing that struck me was that there seems to be this um, affinity for Marxism, like the postmodernists seem to be like, well, I was a Marxist, but then I became a postmodernist. And um we don't believe in closed systems, or we don't believe in, in that there are a lot of closed systems, and that's all we care about, but Marxist would be a good one, right? kind of. I, can you tease yeah, out why right. there's an I mean, affinity? Well, yeah, there's a huge affinity. First of all, every one of the uh, postmodern thinkers was a Marxist, okay? So, for example, Foucault was a Maoist at one point. Uh, Derrida wrote for this uh, leftist Marxist premised uh, periodical called Tel Kel. Uh, uh, Leotard was also a Marxist at some point. So what it is is they broke theoretically from Marxism when, in fact, many things about Marxism had failed. It's predictive. Uh, it's predictive uh, uh, nature. It, it, the fact that it predicted this inevitable rise of socialism, which obviously didn't happen, and then. With the revelations from the Soviet Union and the horrors there, there was a there was a real dis, uh, disillusionment about what what this was all about, and uh, and then the failure of the 1968 student rebellion was another factor that basically I, I think really disillusioned and, and led these theorists to say, well, let's try another tack. Uh, so it really is the ethos of Marxism underlies all of these theories. Whether they're theoretically dog, doctrinaire Marxists or not, it's really, it's it's really it's true that they broke theoretically with Marxism. But the ethos of Marxism, that is, this notion that there are underdogs and that power is at play and that everything is a power relation uh, and that everything is a power gambit and uh, everybody is imposing their power on you through discourse or through whatever, language games or whatever they want to point to, uh, it's still, you know, it's ethically Marxist at base. Are they trying to build, do, like, do they have a utopia in mind or are they just kind of nihilists running around trying to destroy stuff? There's, there's, there's nihilists among them. Uh, here, here's the thing, they, they, they lost faith with, the, faith with the socialist utopian project, frankly. Basically, one other way to look at this is leftists have to be leftists, and it, they have to have something to do. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> uh, and Derrida basically made this pretty clear when he, when he was asked by a reporter, and he just basically said, "I don't know. I just I don't know anything. I just say things." And um, we should effectively, what it is is you have a large disaffected left. Socialism has failed. They're not going to disavow leftism in general, so they got to do something. Uh, and they also, no, seriously. And there's, there's this. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just like, it's just, it's, it's, it's the most pathetic description of that. Like if it makes them sound so pathetic. <laughs> it, I think it's it's, it's really make demonstrable. Yeah, and the other thing about 
French theory especially in particular is they always have to be innovative. So they're always trying to do like, well, let's see what I can do to disrupt and undermine and subvert what he said. And it's just this big, you know, who's really the most subversive and I'll subvert everything, including your thoughts about subversion. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's leftists have got to, got to do left, you know? You have a, I'd really like to hear what you think is going to happen to the social, not the social justice movement, but the, the postmodernist movement. You, you describe something called postmodern suicide. Um, mm -hmm. and you talk about, uh, Jean Baudrillard. I don't know how to say his name. Baudrillard, his, yeah. Jean Baudrillard. His response to 9-11 a little bit. Can you talk about yeah. maybe what, what you mean by that? And do you think that postmodernism is actually going to implode or is that too hopeful? Um, I think it already has committed suicide, but it won't. But that doesn't mean it's not alive. And that okay. follows from <laughs> postmodern. Post <laughs> it's very postmodern. Uh, it's like a hanging corpse that talks. Um, and <laughs> uh, what I meant by what that was reference to Baudrillard was that he basically committed postmodern theoretical suicide because he effectively condoned and celebrated the death of people at 9, in 9-11 in the West. And, and he even suggested that they have a sort, there was a jubilee all around the world. In turn, everybody was either demonstrably or, or privately overjoyed by the implosion of the system. It's, it's suicide. He referred to 9-11 not as an inside job, but as a suicide that the West had tried to kill itself and that it had committed symbolic suicide, in effect, and that's what it was. That's why I call it a suicide, but it's also a suicide on the part of postmodernism to, to make that kind of a amoral, or I should say almost immoral response. It's a, call, it's a callous... Uh, it, it, it combines a moral nihilism with a, a political agenda in a very sick way. And, well, and yet it's not like you saw academia post 9-11 suddenly distance themselves from postmodernism and say, oops, that's not at all. That's horrible. Not at all. That was never even uh, bandied about. In fact, the only guy that got uh, any play was that Eichmann or the guy that said about that there were a bunch of little Eichmanns that died in 9-11. Right. I forget his name. I do too, but I know who you're talking about. Yeah. 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 Uh, Baudrillard, and, and he really, he only got some pushback, I think, a little bit from Zizek. But I think Zizek basically falls for the whole simulacrum idea, too, that, you know, we're living in a simulacrum. So if something's destroyed, so what? It's not really there. It's, uh, it's such. It's just an appearance of the real. Which is, again, so <laughs> pretentious and elitist. That, like, yeah. I, just I think don't know it, it's. it's and this moral nihilism combined with a political agenda, I think we can see as, as it work today, right? The yeah. celebration over the killing of uh, the so-called uh, far right-wing uh, supremacist in, uh, was it Kenosha, I guess? Uh, yeah, no, Portland, the Portland Oh, uh, in Portland, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was just, I mean, they're just, they're just in glee over this. So they really, they do, really don't have, uh, they've lost, the, they don't have a moral basis for anything. Uh, you know, and so it, it's 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 kind of like this idea that it's it's very Soviet too, though. Like there was a, a kind of sacrifice of people to an abstraction, you know, and people don't matter. Uh, it's the abstraction that matters, and uh, as long as it's towards the ends of this abstraction, then it's all good. You know, I think it's. I don't know if this is actually happening, but I'm I'm hoping that people are waking up to this. It seems to me that, I mean, this kind of, for lack of a better term, just bad philosophy has been, yeah. uh, has took root in universities decades mm -hmm. and decades ago, right? This oh, is yes. not new. Um, not at all. And, and yet I think for a long time, everyone was just kind of like saying, well, it's just philosophy. It doesn't matter. Uh, That's right. It, you know, it, those, those, what... those ridiculous English PhDs, just let them do their thing. They're not going to hurt anyone. And here we are. That's um, right. That's because they have a misunderstanding about what the university is, about like academia. You know, and I've said this before that 
the use of the notion of the ivory tower has led has let academia hide its role as an, an ideological apparatus in plain sight. Uh, so this idea that oh whatever happens in academia that's that's some sort of ivory tower those people don't matter what they're doing over there is isolated from the rest of the world and so forth this is totally crazy and the fact is it's an ideological apparatus that perpetrates and produces and perpetrates ideology disseminates it throughout the whole social body so now we see the, the very ideas that the, these people were incubating for decades have now metastasized and, and infiltrated everything, including corporate America and, from what I understand, the state and even the military. So, I mean, this has gone all over the place. Well, and a lot of and and it's so old that uh, there are people in power at this point who went through university and were fully bought into these ideas, just right. maybe didn't implement them as much. They weren't being asked to implement them, or there wasn't social pressure to implement them. But they accepted the premises. Um, yeah, pretty yeah, pretty severely. Yeah, I mean, like go back to critical race theory if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay, so it is possible that it derives, it does derive theoretically from the uh, Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. That's true. And the idea there is that the Frankfurt School looked at the whole totality, as you will, if you will, as oppressive, and uh, and uh, therefore whatever pertained in any of the parts was oppressive as well. So. They take that same notion and they see the totality of everything in its very, to the core, in, as intrinsically racist. So everything is racist to the letter, in counting the legal system, whatever it says to the contrary notwithstanding, whatever it says about equality notwithstanding, it's racist. There's nothing redeemable in there, nothing. So it has to be eradicated. This is all very, this falls from the Frankfurt schools. Uh, notion of negation. They wanted to negate everything that was uh, that was uh, what they called repressive or oppressive. Yeah. Well, and 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 um, what's his name? Uh, Marcusa had in in repressive tolerance. Like he okay. explicitly talks about. I feel like he kind of laid out. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to infiltrate academia, and we're going to do these things. Oh, yeah. And we just they just kind of did. They and, did it. I mean, in repressive tolerance, uh, which I talk about in this course uh, a great deal, uh, basically it comes down to saying this. Uh, the only speech that should be allowed is liberatory speech and expression. And ideas, even thoughts, he says, should be pre-censored. So he even uses the word pre-censorship. Yep. Because they are liberational or liberatory, as they would say. They're allowed, but anything else is to be prohibited, proscribed in advance. So it lays the it lays out the exact uh, format for this kind of censorship that we see going on today. I mean, it's they followed it to the letter. Well, and his his idea of of liberatory uh, mm -hmm. it, it is a presumption about. Uh, some form of Marxism is is yes. superior and is liberating, and therefore right. it, that's what's liberatory, not what that's you right. might normally call liberatory. Yes, in fact, uh, he said in One Dimensional Man early in the book, he says uh, the the abolition of the free market would be one of the greatest achievements of civilization should it be achieved. So no political so, agenda there. No, that's so just, they have this notion of freedom that's different from uh, ours. Basically, what they think is that freedom is freedom from necessity. That is, freedom from uh, the possibility of want or the exigencies of uh, material existence and so forth. But see, this this is just not possible. <laughs> right. That you can't have freedom from necessity because it's necessary to be there. I mean, want and scarcity are, are just realities because wants and needs are not finite and like, likewise there is no such thing as freedom from necessity so the, they'll use any means necessary to impose to achieve freedom from necessity including squelching freedom right. i mean that's really what it comes down to i'm glad you brought that up because i remember uh it's flying around here somewhere but i my my copy of repressive tolerance i remember underlining this like and say like look his, his freedom is like 
I want the freedom to not have to provide for myself at all. I want the freedom to not have to do anything to get all of my needs provided. Um, That's exactly right. Which is just- And they, they said that that was possible based on the super abundance of wealth that was produced by capitalism. You know, they actually lamented the fact that working class people, as they would put it, were enjoying the benefits of capitalist wealth production, that they were enjoying, they were enjoying consumerism, the rise of their uh, relative affluence, uh, uh, entertainment of all sorts. They thought these were a horrible developments. Because they were preventing course, the Marxist revolution, right? That's right. They precluded yeah. the possibility that the continually immiserated working class would finally rise up and overthrow the system. And that's why they gave up on the working class as the agent of history. And this is what qualifies them as neo-Marxists. Um, they gave up that agent because they said they were hopelessly conservative. Now, I, I, and there, I don't want to... That, go ahead. That makes sense of why they're the deplorables right now, right? They're hopeless. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't want to imply that I don't think Marx himself was an elitist, because I do. Uh, but <laughs> it certainly enables another level of elitism to be able to say, well, uh, we tried to give these deplorables what they wanted, but they're too stupid. They're caught up in uh, this hegemonic... Uh, uh, false consciousness. False, thank you. Thank you. False consciousness that's been... Right that's been perpetrated by the capitalists. And so we're going to know, we're going to, we know it's better for them. We're going to fix it. It's interesting because they always suggest that they are somehow to escape this ideological programming, which others are subjected to. Right. So they, they imagine that they're the Neos, right? In the matrix and that they somehow are exempt from what they're talking about. Everything about the Frankfurt school is all like that too. You know, yep. they write about, you know, in the culture industry, enlightenment is mass deception, how utterly duped the masses are. But yep. they're able to see it. So therefore, they're somehow they have this consciousness that's able to gain this Archimedean standpoint from which they can see where everybody else is just duped into false consciousness. Whereas they don't give any credit to people maybe actually following their own interests. Right. They're, it's very condescending. Um, yes, you know, you know, I, I, not to, I, I'll, I can't believe I'm about to defend Marcusa, but there, there was something that I think there's a grain of truth in, in mm -hmm. some of this, which is, uh, I do think that he's right that there is sort of a milieu that is that exists that perpetuates this the system, but his definition of the system is capitalism, whereas I think mm -hmm. as a small, I'm a very small government kind of guy, right? I'm like where mm -hmm. I would say, well, the system is really the, the the power structures that are there, which aren't necessarily free markets and capitalism, they That's are right. the institutions, universities, bureaucracies. Uh, this is partly why you see um, the inevitable growth of bureaucracies, because there mm -hmm. is a lot of there is kind of a there is a, there is a con. I, I, I don't want to say it's. They can't control what people think, but there is definitely there, there, a framing of the discussion. There, the there's, a, there's a ruling elite. Yeah. There's, there is a ruling elite. But the irony is, it's the left that's the ruling elite now. So everything, when you read Marcusa, it's so ironic to me right now to read him because the way he describes dominance and the repression of uh, expression, it all applies the other way. And maybe it was always that way. Um, but uh, they don't recognize that the, the elite ex exists, but they are not the results of the free market at all. They're the results of monopolies and would-be monopolization of production. Yep. And the funny, the real irony is that today the left is the biggest foot soldier for these monopolies that ever existed. That is so crazy, and it's a great segue into Google Archipelago because okay. um, I was uh, I already based on my own viewpoint. I already kind of, and I've had a lot of experience with business and startups and stuff for most of my life, and so I kind of already know that corporations aren't the 
philosophical capitalists that everyone thinks they are all the time. Okay. But you went and looked up the history of Gillette, and I that blew my mind. Can you talk about the founder a little bit? Because I think that's fascinating. Yes, uh, King Camp Gillette uh, was the founder of Gillette, what is the Gillette Razor Blade Company, or um, it had a different name at the first, but he wrestled the uh, he wrestled control of the company back from his early inve uh, investors and gained control of the company to then rename it. Um, so this guy was a corporate socialist. That's that's all I call it. Uh, that's how it's been called by Anthony Sutton as well. And that is, he believed he was his aim was socialism. But his, his means for attaining socialism was through monopoly, through corporate monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how that can get to the exact same place, isn't it? Yes, it gets to the same place. And he said, the socialists, we're the real socialists of the world. To, to date, the socialists have tried to agitate or fight for socialism through politics and and activism, but the way to get there is through the development of a, a world corporation, if you will. That's exactly what he called it in a book by the same title. The world world corporation was the title of one of his books. And that this, what would happen was, monopoly was was uh, monopolization was an inexorable uh, development. That it's a natural phenomenon that, that wealth will accumulate and and, and will grow into monopolies. And he, instead of fighting this, he advocated for it, and that one corporation would subsume all others and become the producer of everything, everything, and the state at the same time. And the way it would happen is they would, people would buy shares in this world corporation, and then what they would do would get rid of the they would even out the shareholding so that everybody eventually had an equal share in world corporation and this would be socialism. Uh, yeah. So he wouldn't mind the new ads so much, maybe. Not at all. In fact, he would have been way further along. He would have been, you know, he, he, would, he was beyond woke. Yeah. Not to, <laughs> <laughs> not to use your own title. But yeah, look, yeah. I, I think that the fascinating thing to me is like, you, you point this out also that I, the new Gillette ads, and I think everyone that watches our channel has probably seen them, the, 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 you know, the toxic masculinity ads, they, um, right. I think they, you, you, have, you said they, they correctly identified the, one of the threats to their, uh, their plan, which is competition kind of mm -hmm. packaged in toxic masculinity, this idea that like someone will fight them on their plan, we need to eradicate toxic masculinity. That needs to be the next enemy. Right, because for Gillette, he saw competition as the, mo as the root of all evil. It was the root of everything, poverty, insanity, prostitution, on and on and on. Every ill that could be found in society was based in competition, and so you had to get rid of competition. And what I said in the book was that Gillette... The, the company today realized that yes, uh, competition is the root of all evil, and they found its source, which was toxic masculinity. So they have to eradicate that. Yeah, that was my my point there. But it's kind of a tongue in cheek statement. But yeah. Well, but I mean, it may be tongue in cheek, but it's it's eye opening, I think, for a lot of people to to real because I think I've I've talked to a lot of friends on the uh, I won't they would have said they were on the left five years ago. Now I don't know where they say they are because the left moved, but. Um, yeah, they, they, they find it perplexing that like, why would these companies <clears throat> support this stuff? Um, and I think it's eye opening to see like, look, these companies have always, some of these companies have always supported this stuff. They've yeah. always supported it. Yeah. And see this, yeah, corporate socialism developed in 1894, I think. And, and the first treatise was by Gillette called the human drift, the human drift. And basically the drift was towards monopolization. Right. And uh, I forget what he called this first corporation, but eventually by, the, by his third book, it was called, or second book, it was called World Corporation. And uh, yeah, so they've always, they've always had these ideals. Yeah. And contrary to what I think, say this is one, one of my arguments, and uh, I get pushback for this because people say, oh, you know, go woke and go broke. 
But I suggest that wokeness actually aligns perfectly with corporate objectives, with corporate monopolistic objectives. I, I, I completely agree with you, actually. And I mean, I've had this conversation with people. Um, so I just so you know, I spent like 20 years in the startup world and have yeah. advised hundreds of startups. And one thing that becomes very clear just uh, empirically <laughs> is mm. the realization that large corporations actually, if they like being regulated a little bit because right. it puts them in right. bed with the government, it ensconces their monopoly, and it sh right. shuts the little guy out. Little guys can't afford a $15 million. It's, it's $15 million basically now after um, Sarbanes-Oxley to take your company public. That's not That's right. easy for small companies. Reg regulation, it raises the cost of entry. That's right. And therefore, it keeps that competition. Uh, yep. And then, of course, on the government side, there's regulatory capture, which benefits yes. the government. So yep. it's a revolving door. Those two. <laughs> right. It's like we will induce you into regulation. We'll give you something for it, and then we'll get something in re in, in return. So it's basically, a, you know, one hand washes the other deal uh, for the state to grow its power and for the corporate monopolists to you know to keep competition out. So. This is what the left doesn't get. They just don't understand the distinction between free market ideals and uh, monopoly. And they think that monopoly is an e inevitable development from the free market, but it's not. It's actually a status interventionism that allows it. I don't think we've really had monopolies arise out of the free market without the help of the state in historically. Uh, to, right. Not much, at least to my knowledge. But you know, the, the older I get, the more uh, I think the more I kind of come back to this old Socrates way of thinking, which is our problems are our definitions. Can we focus on definitions? Because I see an equivocation with the word capitalist, and I want to throw this out mm -hmm. here, or an ambiguity that I think is responsible for a lot of this. Yeah. To me, when I think of the word capitalist, I think of someone who supports free market ideas. I think of von Mises. Like mm -hmm. that's that's what I mm -hmm. think when I think of capitalist. But mm -hmm. the word capitalist is also used to mean someone who exploits the current system to gain capital and wealth. And right. that's, those are two, these could be two completely different things. They're totally different. And, and in fact, I hate the word capitalism because, first of all, I did a, a very minimalistic uh, etymology of the term. Every usage from the, I mean, almost nine tenths of the time that it's been used in history in, in a big way have been pejorative. It, it was it was first coined, I think, in 18 something, and in an English periodical. I, I read about this in Beyond Wealth. I can't remember the date or the periodical right now. But in any case, the first usage of the term capitalism was negative, and it was it was referring to bankers gaining uh, using uh, banking to gain control over uh, economies through the uh, through usury through interests. So, and then of course, Marx uses it. So almost every usage is negative. So I think if the term itself is problem, is a problem. And uh, really the, the issue is, is not, the right term for what, what we're talking about is free market economics. And capitalism should be reserved for attempts to monopolize and or extort, in effect. Um, so, but that distinction will not be made. So we're going to be stuck with the word capitalism. There's no way to overcome, I think, uh, to deconstruct the, the concept of capitalism in, people, in the vast majority of people's minds. It won't work. So we're stuck with it. We just have to fight for it. And I think we can still distinguish between cap, you know, free market economics and, uh, you know, uh, unfair business practices based on the aid of the state. Yeah. And, and the, the privatization of the, you know, I'm, the neoliberalists, people that criticize neoliberalism always criticize the privatization of governmental function. What really alarms me is the governmentalization of private industry. Yes, that's the real problem. <laughs> yes. You know, it, it's it's funny that you say that. By the way, I one of the things that I liked, <laughs> that I was very impressed by. I'm just here's I, I was reading you, and I was like, okay, here's a guy who's got a PhD in postmodernism, but he's talking about von Mises and knows von <laughs> Mises. <laughs> like, 
Von Mises to me is like the god of economic. Like I, Von Mises is probably the one person that if you had to read, force every college student to read. I mean, he's dense and he's difficult, but uh, yes. man, is he packed, jam packed with with oh, great stuff. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. And after I read his takedown of Marxism, I was like, yes, because <laughs> yeah. I was free. Um, you know, intellectually, I was finally freed from the manacles that shackled me into Marxist thinking, which is basically inculcated throughout my, it was inculcated throughout my entire graduate uh, education. It just slowly reel you into it and make you think there's nothing, there's no other intelligent way, there's no other intellectual way to be, to right. be an intellectual. That, that's one of the big things that people don't recognize is that all throughout Europe especially, the only respectable intellectual tradition from the, from the early 20th century on until till now even was Marxism. And that's why I found it really wonderful to see a protest in Germany over the lockdowns and people holding signs saying, read Mises, not Marx. Oh, I didn't see that, but yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, that's it awesome. is. But I Mises mean, he... crushes Marxism. I oh. think he crushes it. And I, I mean, I found myself, chapter seven of uh, theory and history, just rolling on the floor laughing. It's so beautiful. <laughs> he lampoons it to death, but he perfectly. Does. Yeah. 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 And he's, and he's very rigorous. He's not, he's, there's not very a lot rigorous. of like, oh, a to B to C, quickly move over. Like he no, dives it's not into rhetoric everything. either. It's actual analysis. It's not sheer rhetoric. Yeah. But he does explode their rhetoric. Yeah. Uh, and shows where they're trying to get away with things using just papering over things with rhetoric. Like, you know, the question about how, how did Marxism deal with the devastating critique dealt to Marx socialism by political economists? Well, they just called them bourgeois, and that was it. They're just hopelessly... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, speaking of bourgeois, actually, uh, do you think uh, this would maybe explain why this is more prevalent in Europe? I, I, this is just off the top of my head. I'm wondering if this academic approach to Marxism or the, the affinity to Marxism really stems from kind of an uh, arist aristocratic sense of like, well, the trading is that's for the little peons that have to mm -hmm. work and mm -hmm. trade their wares amongst each other. And we're that, always we've been the aristocracy, so we are above yeah. all that dirty money stuff. Yes. I mean, you can see this even in uh, the Communist Manifesto. He, he hates bourgeois, what he calls bourgeois, icy calculation and uh, you know, basically, it very it very much resembles the criticism of the bourgeoisie that Thomas Carlyle, who he who was what we might call or what Marx called a feudalistic socialist, uh, this kind of disdain for everything about uh, bourgeois rationality and the and then hucksterism, you know. And I, I got to admit this myself: when I would be stuck dealing with uh, somebody that was arguing with me against socialism, I would just resort to phrase like, oh, you're just a huckster anyway. You probably just, you know, so there was this. <laughs> you probably just sell things people want and make money. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it was always like, yes, that's this, that's foul and low. And so, yes, it is. There is in there an aristocratic disdain for the market and for everything having to do with it. It's filthy. It's deemed as, as, as contaminating our highest state, you know, because yep. intellectuals do not disdain, do not, you know, we don't deign to trade our wares. We just rent keep, you know. Right. right. Which is just another way of saying no one actually values what we have to say. <laughs> right. That's right. No one would voluntarily give us money for our opinions. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I, it strikes me that um, something that's, I don't know if this has changed in American life, but I feel like it has. Um, in the past, especially in more rural towns, I mean, cities have gotten bigger and, 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 and more dense, but uh, I think you would have more social mixing between rich and poor, like the same, the, yeah. the rich guy in town would go sit at the bar next to the, the steel worker yeah. and they would have a drink together. Right. Um, and I think that's not happening as much, which allows for this aristocratic elitism to kind of manifest itself and fester. 
Yeah, but I don't think it's so much that there's a lack of mixing between the business person and you know the, the owner and the worker. I think it's this elitism is based on a, a distinction between the status, you know, and uh, rent seekers and the plebes, right? Yep. Um, so the the elitism is not coming from you know, Mark Zuckerberg, per se. I mean, although he also indulges it as well. It's coming from those people, like those kinds that disdain, you know, the plebes. And and those people are not necessarily rich at at all. In fact, they're using their cultural capital, I guess you could say, to sort of... Their greasy hair and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's right. You <laughs> saw that, didn't you? <laughs> uh, on Zizak, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're using cultural capital as a means to distinguish themselves from the, the lowly hoi polloi. <laughs> right. Which, by the way, I think is one of the things, um, not to get into politics too much, but it, <clears throat> this just struck me because it was, uh, I saw it on Twitter yesterday. I think it's one of the things that the working class, I hate the term working class, but I'll use it. Me uh, too. I, I use it in brackets or... Yeah, I, I hate it, but you know what I mean by it. Um, it's one of the reasons I think people are are pushing back on some of the 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 I'll say long the democratic establishment and this, the Nancy Pelosi uh, video yesterday of like, mm-hmm. oh yes, I got my hair cut, but it was like it was a setup. Uh, they yeah, enticed right. me in to get my hair cut, and so just so right. they could show that I was a hypocrite. It's this disdain right. for the working class that yes. is just really, I think, people. It's palpable, and I think it's one of the reasons people didn't like Hillary Clinton. Yes, there's this kind of uh, political exceptionalism that they have, right? That they are of the elite political establishment. It's an establishmentarian elitism, and that it, the, the rules don't apply to them. It was another. Uh, video or photograph taken of Cuomo outside without a mask on just a day after he said that it was absolutely essential that everyone wear masks. So, I mean, they're really unmasking themselves, aren't they? <laughs> it literally and figuratively, they're, they're, yes. As, as Derrida I would say, they're deconstructing themselves because as, <laughs> as, yep. as, as deconstruction holds, you don't deconstruct the text, it deconstructs itself. Yeah. We just watch. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I wanted to, we kind of started to veer this direction, but then we got off course and I want to bring us back to this because I think it's fascinating. Um, so I've been paying attention to China's social credit system for a little while. Um, my, my wife grew up in China and so I, I read about this and we, we see what was going on and her parents were, you know, in the cultural revolution and that kind of stuff. And there's definitely parallels to what's happening now. Um, but you talk about something that I think is really fascinating. You, I think you talked about um, the panopticonic kind of, I don't know if that's the right word, uh, perspective panoptic. on yeah. panoptic, uh, on, uh, on the surveillance state and how in the past you had this gulag where it was a state that would maybe affect a smaller number of people very severely and physically, but now it's kind of inverted and it's everyone's affected they're doing that right. self-censorship that Marcusa talked about and um, – Foucault. Foucault. Or sorry, yeah. For, Foucault. Yeah, talked about. And, yeah. Uh, and, and it might be, as we, we just discussed the merging of the, the state and companies, that the distinction between Google and the government is starting to get fuzzier, so it kind of doesn't matter. I, could you lay out that risk yeah, for I mean, people I, a little bit? I, I suggested that – you know, these, this is what I was talking about earlier, is the governmentalization of private industry. Where, I, you know, so, for example, I mean, on, on, uh, on the Internet, all these spaces are privately held. And so, uh, you know, so-called First Amendment rights and all that do not apply in those spaces because they're not governmental sites. And this is what the left will always point out. You know, I think you're not being censored. This is not the state. Right. Well... I think that there, first of all, we could talk about Google's funding in the beginning, which was from the intelligence agencies, okay, to begin with. So it got a lot of its startup money from the state, and it, did, and it was established to, to do state functions, or the state would tap into them as a resource. 
and you see all kinds of contracting of intelligence agency work to private contractors anyway. So they're, what they are is state apparatuses. They're extensions of the state. So you can't really say they're not the state. They are part of the state. This is a state that's metastasizing and that's incorporating private industry into its uh, arsenal, if you will. And so, uh, and, and you see the policing and censorship going on on Google, by Google and Facebook and Twitter, especially the worst. Uh, these organizations are serving state functions now. Yep. And they've made it very hard, this uh, conflation of state and private industry has made it very hard for anyone to point at them and say, this is the state and this is the right. private industry and here's the line separating. So, um, right. You can cherry pick whichever you want them to be to support your argument. That's oh, they're right. part of the state. Oh, they're not part of the state, right? Well, yeah, like I revised my um, thesis since, uh, I haven't written it yet, uh, since the uh, Google Archipelago in which I said these basically were becoming the state. What I think they are is massive appendages of the state. Um, right. They are not the state itself, but they are the state, and I don't mean now the I'm not talking about like the political. I'm not talking here about the president or anything. I'm talking about what has been referred to as the deep state. That is the bureaucratic institutions of the state that do work uh, without you know having to announce policies or get votes on and and, and all that. This is this is a uh, an endemic part of what what has been called, for lack of better terms, a deep state. It's an entrenched bureaucracy. And uh, uh, that has power that you can't even overturn through political means, really. Right. Uh, As Trump is finding uh, so, out, actually. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the other thing that strikes me is, um, so I was a I was a cryptographer for a while. And so I, I would pay attention to information security you know, 20 years ago. And um, I think people don't realize that even if you don't have the marriage of the company in the state in the sense that you're talking about, you do have private companies enabling the state to do things that they could otherwise never do. And the example I'll use is like uh, AT&T here in San Francisco had, I don't know if they still do, but they had a huge building where um, with all uh, their their trunk uh, cables all went into this building. This was the, basically, yeah. think of it as a large switch. Information all came to this building and went out from this building. It was a hub. And, yeah. um, you know, who do you think has access to the boxes in that hub so that they can monitor whatever traffic they want, if they want to, for whatever reason they want to, mm -hmm. uh, the state. And that's right. they don't have to be funding AT&T. All they have to do is walk into AT&T and say, we want this. It right. would behoove you to be nice to us. That's right. That's right. And that's exactly what they did with these information technologies, Google in particular. See, so whenever the internet was founded in the early 90s, the, the intelligence agency realized in a massive, the opportunity for a massive information gathering uh, mechanism and device. And so they funded Google and they started this, uh, this new process of information gathering and surveillance through, through, through that. And they saw that this, this was people volunteering information like never before. And yep. so, you know, under the premise of trying to avert uh, and stop terrorism and other such things, which, you know, I, I understand that premise, they were able to then, of course, gather massive amounts of information on everybody. So um, it, it was like, okay, in that case, they actually funded them. And so the understanding was clear. We're going to be able to use you as well, right? Uh, in other cases, they're not necessarily funded, but you're right. If a, if the feds come over to your 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 place of business and say you have data that we want, you would be very ill served to, to deny them that data, right? Yeah. And when the mafia shows up and says, "Would you like to give a tribute?" <laughs> That's right. You probably should, right? Uh, right? If you value your legs. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I I um. Uh, I lost my train of thought. I was going to ask about something related to... Oh, I know what I was going to ask you about. Uh, I, I may say something contrarian here, but 
I, I was going to ask you about the TikTok WeChat um, thing because my view on on TikTok and WeChat, frankly, is as an American citizen, I would rather the Chinese government have access to my information than my government because they're they don't mm. give a crap what I'm doing in China. Uh, right. But it's it's my feds that are going to give like create hell for me. Um, do, have, have you been following that? And do you have any thoughts about? I haven't followed it, but I will say this. And it's kind of an aside, but it's still on point. Is my book Google Archipelago has been banned by the Chinese government, so I oh. kind of do care what they think. <laughs> wow, I, I, I didn't realize that. I take it as the badge of honor, but uh, yeah, it's on the banned book list. Well, I think one of the only differences, though, I mean, I look, I don't want to be super cynical, but one of the only differences between the Chinese state apparatus and its surveillance and the U.S. surveillance system is China's obvious and open about it and maybe a little farther ahead, uh, but yeah. not much. And the U.S. just pretends that they don't do that. It's more surreptitious. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there's yeah, really I not agree a with huge that. difference. No, I agree. I agree that I would be I, I would be much more worried if my own state were surveilling on me and which, you know, no doubt they are, but not not me in particular. I'm not egocentric to that extent. But, I, you know, because they have power over me directly. They can tax me. They can audit me. They can do all kinds of things that would be very unpleasant, right? Or they could put they could put a, a warrant out for me, like, you know, with Snowden. So, uh, yeah, I'm more concerned about what the government that under which I live uh, has a power that over me that then China has a bad opinion of me. That's right. different. Well, and I think a lot of people maybe don't realize that, you know, they don't actually have to be targeting you to save all of your data and target right. you later. Not at all. There's some reason later that they like to, that it's they want later. to go after you. Especially if you cause problems of some sort, you know, right. then it, it's used to, uh, over you to, to control you, I think. So what do you think the, what's the, What's the path forward for dealing with the surveillance state? Because you're not a Luddite. Um, no, not at all. I love technology. That's the irony. You know, I really love it. I worked in AI yep. uh, for five years. And uh, so at Carnegie Mellon's Robotics Institute. Uh, and so I, I actually love technology. I don't know. I, I, I got to be honest. I don't have the solution to that one. I'm not. I don't know if anyone does. I was just hoping you might. This, this <laughs> yeah. AI guy, maybe you had a solution to it. <laughs> uh, do... I do have a solution in my fiction, uh, in the the in the, uh, the new novel that's coming out called the the Thought Criminal, which will be out December first. Oh, but, cool. um So if people want to take from that and extrapolate on whether how how we could apply that in in uh, in the non fictive world, they can do so. Uh, we have a we have a book club that we do at Unsafe Space, and we alternate between fiction and nonfiction. So I'm going to put that on our fiction list. That sounds uh, oh, thank you. Sounds yeah, the fascinating thought. actually. Yeah. yeah, you do have a solution for at least a suggestion for dealing with social justice in the future, and you've talked about not trying to eradicate it from you know. Yeah, that's right. can, can you talk about what you think the answer is? Yeah, there I mean, for as a civil right? libertarian who believes in free expression and so forth, I would be a hypocrite to say that we have to squash them. They can't speak and they can't espouse their views. That's absurd. So what I think is that what happened is they have, they have taken the throne. They, they basically are the official arbiters of institutions now. They have to be debunked, not eradicated. Let these people speak their minds like any other religious uh, person wants to speak their mind. And so I call it a post-secular position in which you have a, a non-partial ob, uh, arbiter that allows different views to be expressed without privileging one of them over the others. It's just the same solution that the U.S. government uh, established with reference to religious freedom. Right. But to do that, you've got to have that post-secular arbiter. There's some set of premises that that arbiter has to buy Yeah, there into. have to be premises. And, and I know some religious people would say those are religious, uh, too. They would always be religious because if you put a, a kind of so-called non uh, partial arbiter, that's a state in effect, and that state is re is a religion because it holds certain values with reference to all kinds of uh, things, all morality and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a tricky thing, but uh, basically all I'm saying is that 
policy should not be written by these people. And that's what's going on, you know, and education. They're, they're infiltrating the corporations with, you know, critical race theory all over the place. And uh, this stuff is now in, of course, K through PhD, as I put it. Uh, <laughs> yep. It, it started PhD and now it's back to, it's worked its way all the way back to K. Uh, that's right. And probably pre-K. Uh, there's an anti-racist baby book that Carrie has shown before on the show. So, uh, of what? Uh, your anti-racist baby. There's a book for oh, to your baby. <laughs> so pretty soon yeah, there'll be prenatal because... anti-racist tapes you can play to your. I, I would assume that they would say that the child is able to reject the gender they were assigned at birth from birth on, or even maybe in the womb. Right. Um, <laughs> yes. I'm waiting for the day we have gender reassignment surgery in the womb. Yeah, um, that that's right. Be... Oh, hey, don't don't even <laughs> laugh. That's I have I I can't I can't do anything but laugh because I don't. I, don't I know, know I know, but it's not far off probably at all. You know, probably not. everything we think of is probably already being looked at. Yeah, unfortunately, I think you're right. So I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I do want to ask if you've got kind of. Uh, final recommendations for people about how to deal with this, especially if maybe they have kids that they might be sending to college sometime soon or yeah. dealing with it in the workplace. What do you think the best way to fight this um, this ideology is? Well, I, I got to say that um, I, I have to say this. You have to find a standpoint from which you can't be canceled. And, and for me, that is basically to become in, an independent entrepreneur of some sort, uh, to create a cottage industry, to, you know, in a sense, we're going backwards from the rev industrial revolution into small cottage industries. And, uh, and this way you can't be like, I consider myself uncancelable at this point in effect, because what are they going to cancel me from me? Right. Uh, <laughs> You're so, not going to fire yourself. Yeah, that's right. And so I, I would say the same with reference to education. And on that score, uh, I'm, preliminarily trying to find uh, resources right now to create uh, an online you know, uh, college that hopefully would become a university at some point in which we will, you know, we will abjure the running of the college by, by social justice, you know, by wokeness, and that we would be a, a, an institution for free and open inquiry of all, you know. So uh, I think that Parallel institutions have to be created. This is a long, this is a big, this is a tall order. I know that. And also in our personal lives, we have to create parallel economic institutions. That is, I consider myself an intellectual entrepreneur now. That's really what I do. And so if you can find a way to become independent from these hegemonic <laughs> institutions, which have bought into this which I think is a statist ideology, then that's what you should try to do. I, um, to try to be uncancelable, really. Because I, like I don't know how long this could approach, last. Almost. This could go on for 10, 15 years, if history is any indication. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm glad that you're... I'm pretty negative on universities generally at this point. I know a lot of people think they can yeah. be saved, but I, I kind yeah. of feel like they can't be saved and they need to be recreated in some fashion. That's what I think. We have so to create a parallel pro, a parallel operating system, as I put it in uh, the Thought Criminal. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that makes I think that makes a lot of sense. And um, you know, if if every parent stopped funding these guys, I guess. <laughs> I mean, if there was away. a way to stop, you know, having to pay school taxes, right? Because if you're not yep. sending your child to public school, which you shouldn't, uh, then you shouldn't have to pay for it. You know, so everything yeah should be privatized, please. Neoliberalism on that score, privatize everything. Yeah, everything. Yeah. Well, uh, Michael, I really appreciate your time. I could probably ask you a million more questions, but I want to be respectful of your time, and we will have you back. Maybe when your fiction book comes out, we'll do a book club and wonderful. and have you back. That would be wonderful. It's a pleasure to talk to you. It was really, yeah, it was great to talk to you. Uh, can you remind people again how they can follow your work, where they can where they can find you and get your stuff? Sure. Everything is on michaelrechtenwald.com, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-R-E-C-T-E-N-W-A-L-D, one word. 
dot com. No H, no K in the last name. Perfect. Well, thanks again for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, we have a deep content library that includes interviews with everyone from Mike Cernovich to Megan Murphy, so go check it out. If you'd like to see more, please consider supporting the show by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on all the major social media platforms, at least for now, and you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space chat on Telegram. See you there. Warning. This is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized by the Cathedral. Pay no attention to it. For your protection, the following co-conspirators have been unpersoned and marked for cancellation. Please avoid any contact with these individuals. I have calculated a 97.5% chance that they are on the wrong side of history. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Democracy is a perfectly legitimate substitute for morality. Computer voice, Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake. <laughs>